to fall
once in a while we will call. That's all. Soon he'll be there at your side. Good sleep. Okay. And he'll kiss your lips and caress your wings and your heart will
Well, hello everyone. This is Carrie Beck, and I'm going to take one more break and go get my phone so I can check the chat. Just a second. Okay, sorry about that. Um, this is Carrie Beck with How to Homeschool My Child, and tonight we're going to be talking about four steps to raising Christian leaders in your homeschool. And I see that we already have a few people here. Amy's here. I'd be most excited about just having fun if my kids were ready to learn and there was no whining. Oh, I get that. Actually, one of the um, workshops that I've thought about. Oh, my gosh. I got to turn this off. There we go. Turn that off so we don't get some back feed. Um, I'm using a new program. This is the first time. I think it's working. Yesterday it was sort of working. This afternoon it was really working. And I think it's working right now. So um, if you're here, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Um, go ahead and leave a message in the chat. Just let us maybe know how many kids you're homeschooling. And if spring has shown up in your part of the country. Today I went for a walk with yoga pants on and I came home and put shorts on because it had gotten so warm. And yet, you know, like two or three weeks ago in uh, Texas, it was like blizzard and freeze and all of that kind of stuff as well. So I'm trying to make this sort of look. I wanted to like look in the camera, but it's not quite working. So if you are here, go ahead and leave a message. We got, um, let's see, coffee lover from Northwestern Ontario, Canada. Wow, Northwestern uh, Canada. Sherry's here from Wisconsin. Amy's here from Tennessee. I would be most, ex oh, we are history unit study of my kids weren't grumbling. Christina's here from Chicago. Brian and Bree are here from Ohio. Excited to do most anything if my children wouldn't whine. Oh, we got the whiners. I'm so sorry. Um, actually, one of the workshops that I do is Attitude Adjustment 101. And I've been, I haven't done it in a while. I've really been thinking that might be my April masterclass. So we might be doing that as well. Now, I am going to try to get all of this. Let's see if I can figure out clocks. Okay, it's seven o'clock, then it is time to get started. I'm gonna to try to use my, oh, we, oh, Christy's even here from Australia and Anna from Alabama. Welcome, Christy. I've been trying to figure out times that we could actually have people here from Australia and from Europe as well. So um, it is seven o'clock sharp. So we are going to get started. You are here on time. We're gonna get going, use chat. Um, if you hear something that you um, resonates with you, leave it in the chat. If you have a question, leave it in the chat. I may or may not be able to answer it immediately, but I will do my best to come back and either answer it tonight or answer it in our community group as well, which is facebook.com slash groups, how to homeschool my child. So let me just see if we've got everything sort of going and lots of people joining us. All right, sounds good. We're gonna go ahead and start. This is four steps to raising Christian leaders in your homeschool. And my name is Carrie Beck. We are gonna cover a lot of information tonight. We're gonna to cover four steps of leadership education, how to develop character of a leader, practical strategies you can use this week, even though it's Thursday, you could start tomorrow on Friday. Practical strategy, oh, I already said that. Encouraging a love of learning, simple techniques to teach your kids how to think, simple hassle of figuring, saving hassle of figuring this out for yourself, making homeschooling easier with the three R's, three tips to instill leaders character at a young age and how to set up a future leaders personal growth plan. That is a lot to cover. So we are going to jump in and get going. Now, a lot of you already know who I am, Carrie Beck with How to Homeschool My Child. But for those of you that don't, here is an updated picture. This is just from Christmas a couple months ago. And so I just always like to introduce my family since some of you may or may not know who, who we are. So let's just start with the oldest. This is Ashley. She is married to Jesse and they have Elizabeth and Faith, they are their two girls and they live over in Austin. Actually, I'm getting to go over there tomorrow because Elizabeth's birthday was Tuesday and we're having a birthday party on Saturday. This is Gentry, our middle daughter, and she is married to Andrew and they have Landry and Landry's usually a lot happier than she is in that picture, but hey, that was the best picture we got this year at Christmas time. So she's actually 
they're all together right now. Everyone is over there except me in Austin. And so I'll be going over there in the morning. And actually, Ashley is watching Landry. So Gentry and Andrew can have a night out. They're going to go to downtown Austin and stay somewhere. And Hunter left out here about two hours ago to head on over there. He is single and he lives in Houston. And so that is our family. We homeschooled for 10 years. Now, I like to introduce my family because I want you to know who we are and that we, I'm not just making this up or doing some sort of research. And as I talk about that, I want you to know that we're going to talk a little bit about something called the conveyor belt. I know that conveyor belt quite well. Um, I was raised in the public school. I was educated in the public school. I was educated in a modern university. I was actually... Um, uh, have a teaching certificate. I taught in a public school for six years. So when I started homeschooling, I had to do a lot of unwinding and rethinking all of this up here. Um, and it, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I think it was the best thing that ever happened to our kids. I also want you to know that it took me years of trial and error to, to figure out the things that I am sharing tonight. Um, it was experimental. We homeschooled for 10 years and about, about halfway through, I sort of figured out the, what we wanted to do and how we could do that from a biblical worldview as well. And I also like to say that I think the proof is in the pudding. And here is the pudding, Ashley, Hunter, and Gentry. I will be sharing stories about them. I'm not talking about them as if they were five and seven-year-olds and I'm in the midst of it. Although I will talk about my grandkids and some of the things that we do together with them. But my kids are older and I have been able to watch and see the fruit of our labor, basically. Here's the things we did. How do we move forward from there? So let's go ahead and get started. And I'm just going to keep checking the phone every so often because I haven't ever done this before. So feel free to leave a message, a comment in here. Tell us how many kids you're homeschooling, where you're from. And do you have spring yet? We had spring today for the first time, I feel like. Now, let me just, uh, this is something I always like to start with, with this four steps to leadership education. This is a quote that I got about, oh, 2003, so what was that, 17, 18 years ago? We want one class to have a liberal education. Liberal, now I'm not talking Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative. Let's talk about, you can even put in the chat, what do you think a liberal education truly is? Because sometimes the word liberal can really just put us up and we're like, we don't wanna to listen to that lady anymore. What is a liberal education? See if I can actually do some things. Um, here's how I would actually define it. The word liberal comes, and we're not talking just humanities and English and language arts and that kind of thing. The word liberal comes from the word liberate, which means freedom, freeing us. We wanna give our kids an education that frees them from their teacher. We want to give them the tools of learning so they are freed from their teacher. We want to give them the ability to think for themselves so they are freed from having to follow someone over and over and over again. So they say we want one, basically a small class of people to have a liberal education. We want another class to have a very much larger class of necessity to forego the privilege. See, they saw liberal education as a privilege to forego the liberal education and fit themselves to perform specific, specific difficult manual tasks. In other words, they wanted a little bitty group to have this great education and we wanted this great big group to get to just be workers, worker bees. And we just need them to do manual tasks. And you may be going, who in the world said this? And where did this come from? This was actually said at the turn of the 20th century. I want to say 1909 or 1913. I can't remember the exact date. And I don't have it. Oh, 1909. I do have it written down here. Um, turn of the century. It was after the Industrial Revolution. And the industrialists were just pouring money into public education. They needed workers. They did not need thinkers. Think about that. They needed workers. They did not need thinkers. Thinkers would not want to be doing all the things they wanted. They wanted someone that would just follow, obey, work, and do what they were told. So who in the world made this comment? Well, let's see. It was the president of the United States. I'll move my little picture away. 
uh, Woodrow Wilson, the president of the United States. And it was very intentional. Now, this did not come up this did not happen overnight. I would say it took at least four or five decades for this to happen. And around the 60s is when there was a huge shift in education. And that liberal education sort of disappeared. And all we did was worksheets and we just followed and did whatever the teacher said. And the teacher did whatever the principal said. And the principal did whatever the school board said or whomever. So we developed a huge class of followers instead of thinkers, leaders, all right, so that is where we are today. What can we do to move forward? Let's talk about three types of education that I see in going on today. The, oh, and I forgot to tell you, there is a handout and I don't have the link. It was in many emails today. And if you will get that handout, you can follow right along and fill in the information and take notes and everything. Um, it is a Google doc and you could just follow along with that. I apologize. That is actually written at the top of my notes and I forgot to say that. Conveyor belt education. What is a conveyor belt education? It is something that we give our kids so they know what to think. They all enter on the first um, stage. They do all the same things that everyone does. They are tested all the same ways. And if they are approved, they move to the second stage, do all the same things as the second stage. They are tested all the same way and they move all the way down. There are 12 stages. And after 12 stages, you get a stamp of approval and then you are sent off to the market, the job market. And this is basically what school is today, whether it's a private or a public education. You, now, I'm not saying all private schools are like this because there are some private schools that actually encourage thinking and do some good things. But I would say for the most part, people follow the traditional conveyor belt education and they are just teaching them what to think. The next type of education is competitive conveyor belt education. When to think? So when you come, it can be an auto mechanic school. There's a lot of varieties of this. Auto mechanic school, they come in and they go clunk, clunk, clunk. Oh, here's what you do and when this happens. But we could say it is med school. Here's what you do when this thing starts hurting right now. And here's what you do. Now, I'm not comparing the problems of a car to the problems of a human being. I'm just making a statement, an observation about the types of education. These people know when to think and they are on a competitive conveyor belt. It's very similar to the modern university model um, and the trade schools and those kinds of things. People learn when to think this way when this or what to think when this happens. The last type of education is what we're going to spend the rest of our time talking about, and that is a leadership education, and that is where we teach our kids how to think. Now, I'm not going to go into that because that's what the whole rest of this workshop is about. So let's talk about leadership, and the first thing I want to talk about is why race leaders. I spent this afternoon reading through a lot of your responses because when you registered, you had the opportunity to say, why do you want to raise Christian leaders? And I love, I mean, I was so encouraged by some of the things. Some of you said, I'm not a Christian, but I'm here to learn how to homeschool. And I will tell you right now, I believe you will find some very good, solid, practical tips on how to homeschool, whether you're a Christian or not. But I will just tell you, I am a person of faith. My faith is in Jesus Christ. And so when I talk about leaders, I want to talk about raising leaders for Jesus Christ. Uh, Everyone is going to make their own decisions about that. So before we talk about raising leaders, I will say there was one little theme that ran through some of your observations, or I observed with this, and it's not very positive. We will finish with the positive, but many of you wrote that the world is bleak and we need to raise leaders. It is bad times. We need leaders who bring light, which I agree. This is not a class about politics. But I want to make a comment, no matter where you stand today. Yes, it looks bad. I can tell you right now. But before I move on, I want you to remember something. Nancy DeMoss Wolgamuth, who I actually listen to a lot. I'm just now finishing her Bible study on Ruth, um, has a comment that she quotes from Daniel 4.26. And that comment is, heaven rules heaven rules. And it says this about Israel. It was said that the base of the tree and its roots must be left, meaning there's a remnant still left of Israel back in the Old Testament times. That means your nation will be returned to you after you understand that it is heaven rules. 
Heaven rules, God rules, he is sovereign, he is king of kings, he is in charge. And whatever is happening in our world today, yes, we definitely need to raise up Christian leaders, godly leaders, leaders that can move us forward in the right direction. But I think we need to also know that we as parents need to rest on Jesus Christ. He is sovereign, so we are going to rest in him. That's my little side comment for the whole evening. Now let's talk about why we, some positive reasons, not just to get rid of the negative. What are some positive reasons that we can raise leaders? First of all, to influence and to impact those around us. And I thought I had that lower. I hope I have all the right reasons sitting here. But I really think that is a huge thing that we want to influence and impact those around us in our society. Oh, here we go. I really goofed. Another one that I found very interesting was many of you said, we just, we need Christian leaders. I mean, it was time after time after time, all of you were saying we need Christian leaders. And I agree with you because Christian leaders will give us a biblical foundation for our society. We want to raise our kids to be Christian leaders that can stand for Jesus. We want them to share Jesus. We want them to love Jesus. Those are all things about why we need Christian leaders. Plus, it's the right thing to do to raise our kids to lead well. And I believe it's our calling as well. God has called us to be salt and light and truth in a dark world. Many of you said that or parts of that. And I completely agree. We need to raise our kids to be different, to be able to stand up and have the courage to stand up. One of you wrote this and I had to write it down and share. I don't know if you're on tonight, but said we need lights, lights that lead are needed in these dark times. And I thought that was so good. We need lights in our society today. And then we need to prepare our kids for future generations. We need to prepare them to lead the future generations in the right way. And then here we have influence and impact on society. That other slide was really supposed to be deleted. Sorry about that. We want our kids to be raised up leaders so they can serve God and others. And because we want to advance the kingdom of heaven, Jesus kingdom. Now, this one wasn't really mentioned, but I threw it in anyway. I think we need to raise our kids to be leaders, to be business leaders, and to be entrepreneurs. Why? Because business leaders and entrepreneurs have an impact, especially on our local society. I don't know about you, but where I live, the people that are on the nonprofit boards, the people that are on the Chamber of Commerce, the people that have a say on the city council, many of them are business leaders and entrepreneurs. Plus, those are the leaders that really make a difference in society. They're the ones that have the, the money. And I'm not saying money is everything. They also have time to be able to invest in the calling that they are called to do. Another one, y'all, a few people wrote, not a lot, but I'm really glad some people wrote this. We need to raise leaders for freedom. And you may be going, freedom, what do you mean? If you listen to Andrew Pudua in the Life Skills Leadership Summit, he talked a lot about this and we discussed this at the end. He said, you know, one word, I think instead of maybe leadership education, I would call it freedom ship education because we really need to raise our kids in freedom, freedom from serving the government, freedom from serving whomever is telling them what to do, freedom to be able to live their life in a free society. America, if you're from America, I know we have some Canadians and Australians, but we are founded on a free society. And I think leaders are the ones that will keep freedom in our society as well. And then I think finally, just if we raise our kids to be leaders so they can glorify and honor God. Now, not all kids are going to be a CEO. Not all kids are going to be president of the United States or mayor or even an entrepreneur. But I will say pretty much every single one of them will be in a leadership position at one time. If nothing else, and this is a, the most important job they could ever have as a dad and a mom. Dads and moms lead their families and we want to raise our kids to lead well. And I would say that is one of the most important reasons that we want to raise our kids to be leaders. So, um, Oh, this way. So what is a leader? I'm going to talk to you about three different areas of a leader. They're all strategic. The first one is strategic vision. They have a vision of where they go. The uh, proverb says, without a vision, the people perish. The leader is the one that has a vision. They are going forward and people are following them. A leader is not a manager. A manager does not have vision. 
A manager is just managing people to get them to do a task. A leader has a vision and they are influencing and inspiring them to come alongside the greater goal and we all work together. That's what a leader is. A leader also has a strategic mission. And so that's that common goal, whatever that is. Maybe you as a homeschool family, if you're a Christian family, that mission is to serve Jesus Christ. And so you're going to lead and you're going to influence and you're going to raise your kids up to follow that mission. Um, on a side note, mission, we took our kids on many mission trips that were serving God. Even as a young age, I remember Hunter sitting in the dirt in Inner, city, inner parts of Mexico, playing with bottle caps with his friend, his friend who's now married and has his own family. But they were four years old. They were on a mission trip. And I can tell you right now, if I mentioned that to Hunter, he would, he, all the kids would remember, we took at least three trips down to inner, the inner parts of Mexico, one just on the border, it was further down. And so that was to be able to serve. And then the final strategy is a strategic motivation. You want them to you have a motivation and your motivation is similar to your mission. Your mission is more your calling. The gifts of God are irrevocable and your kids have a special calling. And so I would really encourage you on the strategic mission to search out what is their calling and find their mission and then work with that all through your homeschool. If all you're worried about is academics, you're missing out because your kids are more than just books and academics. They have a mission in life, they have a calling and you as a parent, are responsible to help them draw that mission out. But your strategic motivation is more maybe of raising your kids to follow Jesus Christ, to have an impact for God, to have an influence, to win kids to Jesus Christ. There's a lot of motivations that go on with that. So how do we do that with our kids? Number one, we give them opportunities. You as mom and dad need to look for opportunities in all of these areas as well. So I think, oh good, but how do we do all of this? You're talking about leadership and, okay, let's just talk about that. How do we do this? What, with all that curriculum that you've got to do and all those check boxes, how can I ever like get away from the books to be able to do something else? What if I mess them up? Well, I will tell you right now, kids are resilient. And if you mess them up for two years as a seven and eight year old or a 12 and a 13 year old, you're not really going to mess them up. I, there are times I still remember, I won't mention my children's name. I felt like I messed them up and I didn't do the best. I made mistakes. And you know what? They are all adults and they are all following God and serving him and actually raising kids of their own now. But how I'm trying to balance life and family and homeschooling and work and COVID and masks and social distancing and all that stuff. We're going to talk about some specific ideas that you can use in your regular everyday life. But all that clutter around my home and my kids attitude. Well, this isn't necessarily a workshop on getting organized with your clutter or your kid's attitude, but it is a workshop, I think, that will give you some specific strategies that you can use starting tomorrow as well. And let's start with this. Let's get a big picture of where you are as the homeschool mom. And we're going to start with mentors. You are a leader of your child. And leaders are mentors. How do we mentor our kids? The first step in mentoring is modeling. Modeling is the same thing as nurturing. And you may be going, well, why do you have a picture of cookies? I think baking cookies together is a huge picture of modeling and nurturing. Because when my kids are little and when I go to my grandkids tomorrow, we're going to do some craft stuff. They'll do a lot of it on their own. But if we are to bake something together, they're not going to pick up that pan and put it in that hot oven. They are two, four, and six. I will be doing that. I will be modeling things and they will be helping me. And I will be nurturing them in whatever that activity is. Um, I will say modeling has a two-way thing. It can be positive and it can be negative. So let me share you with one you, you one of my mistakes. I've shared it many times. There was a time, Ashley was about five or six years old, and Steve had been talking to me about, Carrie, please quit rolling your eyes. And I was like, I'm not rolling my eyes at you. What are you talking about? And I mean, I just did not get it. Two weeks later, I asked Ashley to do something. She rolled her eyes at me and I thought, Oh, I know where she learned it. Me. It was all from me. And I had to apologize to Ashley. I had to apologize to Steve. 
And so I had to realize that I was modeling in a negative way. Another thing we did was um, we did model please and thank you and good manners. And um, I think that is something that continues with them. My kids are still saying please and thank you. Hunter was here for a few days. We went on a walk and he was continually, whenever we turned the corner, if I was on the outside, all of a sudden, he pushed me over to the inside and he would walk along the outside. We went to an event last night and he was always opening the door for me and making sure I had a seat before he sat down. Those are just things that we modeled. Steve modeled them for him. We also trained them as well, but we modeled those types of things. We modeled please. We said please and thank you over and over again. The next part of being a mentor is teaching and equipping. And I would say this is where we spend most of our time in homeschooling. Um, and so we I'm just double checking. If y'all ever can't hear me or I pop out, please put something in the chat because I am checking it every once in a while since this is the first time I've done it with YouTube and Zoom and all that stuff. Teaching and equipping is what you're going to spend most of your time doing and especially elementary and junior high time. And those are the things we're going to do. We're going to teach and equip them. We're going to teach and equip them in math and language arts, how to change the oil, how to read the Bible and what the Bible means, all of it. We're going to teach them and equip them to be a leader in the future. They've got to have that firm foundation, which many of you said you wanted to have for your kids. The last stage of mentoring is coaching and developing. So let's talk about what is a coach. A coach is someone that plans drills, plans strategies and tactics for the game. Have you ever, let's talk about baseball. We've got a baseball picture here. Have you ever seen a coach leave the, um, bat, uh, what is it, the dugout and go in and pitch the ball or go to outfield and catch the ball in the middle of a game, maybe in practice, but I've never seen a coach uh, just go out there in the middle. Well, okay, maybe in little T-ball peewee league, but when they get older, you don't see coaches. They're on the sidelines. They have spent time preparing the team for what they're going to do. That is what you are doing as a parent when you get to coaching and developing. And that is what you should be doing as teenage, with your kids as teenagers. You should spend time coaching them and developing them and letting them lead. Let me say that again, letting them lead in their education. This is not something, I will tell you, this is something we did and we worked at it. I wanted my kids to lead in their own education. I wanted them to lead in learning to, and they didn't know how to do it. We were walking alongside. We were developing them into lifetime learners who had the tools of learning, who could think for themselves and make wise decisions. That is what a coach does. So he prepares the players to go play in the game. Are you preparing your kids for the game of life? Just think about it. You can even put something in the chat if you want. And if you have any ideas or any suggestions about modeling, teaching, and coaching, put them in the chat. That's one reason I was sort of excited about using YouTube because we can have a chat the whole time and y'all can be helping. You're probably going to have other ideas than I do and probably better ideas than I do anyway. Now, I've realized that these need to also be done age appropriate. I will tell you, I will say you are going to be doing some of this. I'm modeling for my kids now. I'm modeling for my daughters what it's like to raise kids. They still write me, I'm going to start crying. They will still write me cards now that they have kids. Thank you, mom, for showing me how to be a mom and how to be a wife. And so those were things I didn't... I didn't plan that. I didn't plan to model that, but that's what I was doing. What are you modeling for your kids? What are you teaching them? How are you coaching them? Sorry, I tend to sort of get emotional at least once during every master class. So let me see where I am. Um, another thing that's important, especially in this coaching and developing or any of it is it's okay if your kids fall on their face. This is the time for them to fall on their face and you walk with them and help them. It's okay if they fail at something. I will tell you right now, I was bad at that. I did not want them to hurt because uh, I knew what that was like. Shoot, I ran for the student council over and over year after year and never got it. And it hurt, but it built some endurance and persistence in me. And I, this was something I really, I was not good at. I, I mean, I could tell you stories. Was, oh, it's okay. 
Now, I never just yanked them out of anything once they started it, but I might sort of channel them in areas that I thought they would be more successful. So I just say that we don't want them falling on their face and failing all the time, but it's okay because you are there to model, teach, and coach. Okay, so those that's the big picture. Let's start talking about our four steps. Laying a firm foundation. Some Many of you wrote about laying a firm foundation, a biblical foundation of godly character. So the firm foundation is step one of character and righteous character. Whether you're a person of faith or not, I think it's important we, we give our kids a foundation of character. We need to build that into their life. And in Genesis 18, 19, this is God talking to Moses and he says, he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. He was saying, Moses, no, it's Abraham. I'm sorry, I've been reading Moses in my Bible. And yet this is all about Abraham, Genesis 18. And Moses has been in my head because I'm reading through the Bible chronologically. Anyway, Moses, I mean, Abraham was going to direct their sons to do what is right and just. That is righteous living. And that is what we are called to do. One way that we can do that is to teach our kids the armor of God. That is why I have a soldier picture right here. We need to teach our kids what the armor of God is because that will protect them and that will help them walk in a righteous way. In fact, the breastplate of righteousness, doing what is right. And so one, there are two things you can do, or there's many things, but one thing is every morning, I would encourage you to pray the armor of God for you and your family. I do this every morning and I pray that God would, um, and if they're, they may not understand it, they may be three years old, well, God can still put that armor on them. I pray that our family will put on the belt of truth and replace all the lies in their head, that our family will put on that breastplate of righteousness and leave all the sin behind that they, we will walk with our shoes of peace, peace with God, peace with ourselves, peace with each other, that we will put on that shield of faith and hold it up to extinguish all the arrows the enemy is pointing our way, that we will put on our helmet of salvation and our minds will be set above on the spirit that gives life and peace. And we will fight our battles with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and that we will spend time in God's word and that we will pray persistently and pray in the Holy Spirit for believers around the world. Now, I don't know how long that took me, but maybe a minute or two. I do that every single morning. Now, I sort of expand and it's different every morning, but I think it's really important. I did not do this when my kids were younger. I wish I had prayed for our entire family this because I believe God has given us the armor of God. He says in Ephesians 6, so that we can resist the enemy. And when you talk about the times are bad right now and the, it's evil and all, that is the enemy attacking. And this is one way that you can resist the enemy by putting on the armor, you putting it on and your kids putting it on as well. The second thing you can do with the armor of God is teach it to your kids. Teach them what the truth is. Teach them what righteous, what the right thing is to do. Teach them what peace is and how do we live in peace. Now, I'm not saying you do this all in one shot, but you could spend a whole year working on the armor of God. And in fact, this is one of my goals. I'll just tell you, I am releasing a Bible study for kids, or actually it's my family Bible study lessons, um, walking with God this month. Um, another one that I want to release is Armor of God. And so I hope that that comes out sometime this year. And it would give you some real specific tools and easy things that you could print out, you know, print and go kinds of things, as my daughter says. So I think the Armor of God is also very important for leaders to lead well. They need to, you get dressed every single day. I don't think any of you walk out without clothes, but are you walking out without your Armor of God? We need to put that Armor of God every day. And we need to train our kids and teach our kids they need to dress themselves in the armor every single day and maybe pray during your family time, the armor of God every single day. So there's number one character foundation. Next thing is servant leadership. Now, if you, again, if you were at the Life Skills Leadership Summit, I spent the kickoff time talking all about servant leadership. And so I'm not going to talk a lot about that. I will tell you that there was a time, Hunter was a senior in high school and he was playing football. And yes, he went to a private um, school for three years as a classical school. And actually, I think it did a world of good as far as getting 
encouraging him to learn how to think. So I really liked what that had to do. But he was nominated by one of his teachers to be classroom champion in our community. And so the TV station goes out once a week to one of the nominees and interviews him. And so the TV station went out and interviewed Hunter and said, asked him questions. But one of them was, how would you describe your leadership? And his response was, I see myself as a servant leader. He serves the people, the boys on his team. And that's where he becomes a leader. And I think if you want to teach your kids to lead well, they need to serve others. And growing up, one of the best things you can do is teach them how to serve. How could you do that? I've already mentioned, we took our kids on mission trips. We took them, we did all sorts of servant service projects, even when we were at home, but we took them down to Mexico. When they were there, yeah, they were young. It wasn't like they could speak Spanish, but in the mornings they could paint the building we were working on. They could cut out all the supplies for the BBS. We were going to do that afternoon. When we would get to the village we were going to, they were like a magnet with these little kids. We had college kids and older, but our kids were like, oh, they're like, oh, look, there's some American kids. We'll go, we'll go play with soccer with them. And so even though they weren't able to necessarily teach the Bible story, they were able to lead songs. They were able to relate to the other kids. It was a great opportunity for them. So I would encourage you to find some sort of outreach that you can do. Another way we did was we would give money to people. And when we gave money, Steve believed that we gave as gifts. We did not give loans. And there were times I remember, I mean, one time off the top of my head, he gave a friend of ours a thousand dollars. God had blessed us and this person needed it. And he's like, Carrie, this is a gift. We do not expect it. And so that is the way we can serve. Now your kids may not have a thousand dollars, but they may see a need and they could give $5 of their money for someone that needs it, or they could donate it to a nonprofit or charity or cause that you are, um, that is important to you. I think, I can't remember if this is on the next screen. Yes, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. So I think you could flip this and say, those who serve in your family should be exalted. And so if when you see your kids serving others in their family, maybe let them choose what we're gonna eat for dinner or what movie we're gonna watch or what game we're gonna play. Let them be exalted in some way in, their house, in your house as well. And then finally, oh, I meant to bring them and demonstrate, but I didn't. Use scripture to make your decisions. Those are God's rules. There's a difference between God's rules and our family rules. Family rules in our house where you had to be home at 10 or 11 or 12 or whatever. God's rules is do not lie, be respectful. And so one thing that we would do is when our kids, let's say we're arguing or being disrespectful, I, when they were young, I would open the Bible and I would say, let's read this first. It's God's word. What does God say about arguing or disrespect, whatever the verse was? And then we would talk about it. As they got older, I said, I want you to look up three verses on arguing and what God has to say, and then come tell me what he says about it. Then we could discuss it. One thing, it took it off of my shoulders and it put it on God's shoulders. And I'm like, this is God. This is we, the reason we do this is because of God. So I think it's really important that we do that and we tell our kids and teach them what God's rules truly are. And it's not just what we are saying. I wanted to bring this chart out and actually show it to you because I actually have them here. Um, so, oh, hey, coffee lover, praying the armor of God every morning. Thank you. I would do it during our scripture time in the morning. Thank you very much. Um, okay, following God, let me just show what this is. This is, I've got two resources I will show you during all this um, information. This is a chart that comes digitally. You can print it out, you can laminate it, you can print it out, whatever. Each uh, chart is different. This one says make peace and argue. There's a verse here, there's a verse here, and then you write down what the consequence, the reward for being peaceful and the consequence for arguing here. And then you do obey and disobey and so on and so forth. That way you put it on the refrigerator and when they start arguing, you go over to them and say, oh, look, let's read this verse. And then we talk about it. And then we say, this is the consequence in our family. And then you enforce that consequence. Or if you see them making peace or obeying, you come and say, thank you for obeying. Let's go see what happens and whatever it is. Now, on the back of each chart or in the book, it has a, um, I don't know, 10 or 15 
consequences 10 or 15 rewards that you could use as well. So we have those three uh, Fallen God charts. We, this toolkit also has a workshop called Achieving Peace with Consistency and an ebook called Teaching Good Manners, Teaching Tips for Busy Moms ebook. All of that's $35, but the toolkit price is $20. And you can get that at howtohomeschoolmychild.com slash character if that is something that is important to you or something that would be helpful. If you have a question about that, just leave it in the chat and we'll answer it at the end as well. So... All right. Lisa says, I couldn't figure it out how to implement. And I am one, I wanted a Christian perspective. Thank God for you bringing this all together. Well, thank you, Lisa, for your kind words. I would like to go back one thing. If you are not a person of faith, so you may, and I would encourage you to look at the Bible and see what it has to say. I would still encourage you to say, we make peace in our family. We don't argue and put that on the refrigerator and put the reward and the consequence. What that does is it helps you be consistent. And for one thing, many of you say, I'm not consistent. I'm not consistent. This would help you be consistent. And you wouldn't have to be brainstorming off the top of your head. What am I going to do with my kids? Because they're arguing in the other room as you walk over there. So um, that would have helped me tremendously. So that was why I did that. All right, to lead tomorrow, you must learn today. So we're talking about raising our kids to lead tomorrow. What do they need to be doing today? They need to be learning. So step number two is to inspire a love of learning. What is the love of learning? Go ahead and put it in the chat. Normally I don't have a chat, but go ahead and put something in the chat about what you think a love of learning is. Normally when I am in a live workshop, I get responses back and we talk about what is a love of learning? Many of you are like, I want my kids to love learning. I want them to grow up to be lifetime learners. What, how would you describe a love of learning? Yeah, and so forth. This is a picture that I personally think describes a love of learning. This is my oldest granddaughter. It was, gosh, three year, three and a half years ago. Actually, it's about three years ago because it was in March. And uh, her parents needed to paint some of their house because they were selling the house. And she had a little sister who was asleep. And so we went out to this Easter egg farm. And it wasn't just an Easter egg farm. She went on an Easter egg hunt. They had chickens and she was scared to death of those chickens when we first got there and the roosters or whatever. And they had bunny rabbits. So she ended up holding. And obviously she got her face painted. She rode a pony for the first time. She rode a train. There were swings. There were all sorts of things. She, I'll tell you what, this is how I would define a love of learning. Self-directed passion. Oh, I love that. A passion for a growth mindset. Thank you, Susan and Jen, for putting that in. I do think a lot of it is self-directed. It's like a passion about something. Faith was so excited about everything she saw. She was just curious about all of it. And I will tell you, I think toddlers and preschoolers have a love of learning. And this is what we do to them. We go, ah, I mean, you got to sit down here. Here's a stack of workbooks. We got to take care of these workbooks. And we strangle out that love of learning instead of encouraging and inspiring a love of learning. She was constantly asking me questions about what was going on and the chickens. And if I could show you the video of her riding that horse, it was hilarious. She would probably laugh at it now. But she had so much fun. And I really think that's what toddlers and preschoolers are all about. They're, everything's new to them. They love learning about everything. And why do you think they are always saying, why, why, why? Now, sometimes they're saying why, so they don't have to go take a nap. But a lot of times they are truly curious and we just get tired of it. And we sort of choke them out of their love of learning. So let's talk about this for a second. How can we inspire a love of learning? Oh, I thought I had my set of questions. I don't. Let me ask you two questions before we move on. Do your kids love learning? Do you love learning? And you're welcome to put something in the chat. Do your kids love learning? Do your, do your kids love learning? I would gather to say that if you are modeling a love of learning, your kids love learning as well. Maybe not all the time. I always learned, loved learning. I loved learning as a kid, as a college kid, all the time. So I did model a love of learning. I didn't like reading as a child. I, did not, I didn't like it. I really didn't like reading until we started homeschooling. 
Um, so I had to sort of rethink some of that stuff. But modeling is probably one of the best ways that we can teach our kids to love learning. Modeling with enthusiasm. My mother loves birds. And it was probably about 15 years ago, Hunter was at their house and they live on 50 acres and she has bird books, bird song books, bird feeders, bird houses, bird everything. But there was this cute little nest and you could stand on the balcony and look in the bush and the nest was right there. Hunter was there and his friend Rachel was there for the day. And they, oh my goodness, they, well, Rachel loved birds at the time anyway. They were about 10 or 12 years old. And she was always, they were trying to figure out which birds were what. And my mom was all into it. And then they would examine that. They didn't touch the eggs, but they were watching them and everything. They loved it. They were learning about birds and they were not using a workbook or a fill in the blank or a worksheet or whatever. I'm not saying that's not a tool. I'm just saying my mom was so enthusiastic that they just loved it. Now, I will tell you a story. Now, Hunter always loved animals. Um, Rachel did too. Her mom told me just a couple of years ago, when we went to the library, Rachel was always wanting to get an animal book. And I knew that she would grow up to do something with animals. And her mom gave her the freedom to be able to write about animals, write, study animals, read about animals. Well, Rachel right now lives in California and she works for the um, National Park Service in a birding job. That is a perfect story of a mom that she may, she, I don't know if her mom loved it, but she allowed her and modeled a love of learning and let her daughter learn in whatever it was she was interested in. So I would want to encourage you to remember that more is caught than taught. That's true in all areas of life. More is caught than taught. And that's what my mom did. I can give you another story. We, um, I don't know why I keep picking on Hunter because he really didn't like learning as a kid. He'd rather have a baseball. Anything with the ball is what he wanted to do. He is about six or seven years old. We drove to Houston to the museum district and we pull in the parking lot and he goes, oh no, not this museum. I'm like, yep, it was the fine arts museum. He wanted to go to the health museum or the children's museum, something that was a little more hands-on. We get in there. I'm like, listen to three audios about one of these um, Monet paintings. And then guess what? Next door is a Star Wars exhibit. We'll just walk across the hallway and you can um, look at the Star Wars. Now, I want to encourage you that as you are modeling and enth uh, enthusiastic, this takes time. It's not going to change in a week, a month, a year, even a few years. Hunter was six or seven when we had the fine arts. Ugh, he didn't want it. 10 years later, we are in London as a family. We had an event there and we had to work it with the kids. We said, if you'll come and work the event with us, then we will stay and sightsee for a week. I, one day I wanted to go to the National Gallery of Art. The only one in my family that would go to the National Gallery of Art, you guessed it, it was Hunter. The kid who didn't want to go to the Fine Arts Museum when he was six or seven. It takes time to inspire a love of learning. So give yourself grace and give your kids grace as well. Now, what is one simple daily activity you could do to inspire a love of learning? I would say that is to read aloud daily. I read aloud to my kids all the time. I was just sort of, oh, wow, thank y'all. Uh, baseball, football, daughter is small. She loves learning. Yes. Thank you for keeping that up. I'm just going to tell you, when y'all write things in the chat, that just inspires me to keep going. Thank you so much. One simple daily activity is to read out loud. I remember being right over there on the other side of that wall as a hallway, and my daughters were sleeping in the same bedroom, and I would turn the lights out. I would leave the hall light out, and I would read Little Women to them. I want to say they were either four or six, four and six or five and seven. And I, I mean, I need to ask them this weekend if they remember that, but we read so many books, but then once I got older and Hunter was a little bit able to sit through some of those books, then we would begin our day with our read aloud. I believe read aloud does several things. It opens their minds to worlds that they may not have thought of. It opens them to areas of life that they do or maybe don't even care about, but they learn about them. It builds relationships between you 
and your child. It is a special time when you can go in the wherever you are and read together. We would read together each morning. It was the first activity of the day, not math. The first year I instituted it, they're like, what about math? I was like, don't worry about it. Reading aloud together is more important. So we would start every day with reading aloud. I would say most nights after dinner, not all the time, Steve would read a book. He, uh, especially when the kids were older, we read the Little Britches series. And so we would, and I will tell you how I knew the kids were enjoying it. When they are talking in the van about the grandpa in book three and laughing and saying, we're so glad our grandpa isn't so grumpy like that man. We would never want a grandpa like that. That means they had they dove into the world of little britches and what was going on in his family. That to me was exciting to hear. It also encourages our kids to love reading, to love books. And I will tell you right now, I have three granddaughters and they all love books. I've got two Easter books sitting over there on the counter to take one for each family. Because for holidays, I try to give each one of them a new book. And so they will love it. Uh, little Landry, you could just sit for hours. She will just, and of course, she wants to listen to the same thing over and over again, but that's a different story. One thing I would encourage you to do when you're doing the read aloud with a family with more than one child is to rotate the types of books you read. Gentry, it didn't matter what book we read. She loves, but she's always loved reading and writing. She loves all books and pretty much we could read anything and she would be okay with it. Ashley was more into history, maybe a little bit of science as well. Hunter, he wasn't interested in much of anything. He, was, he did like books with water, like Swiss Family Robinson. And so I would try to rotate one of those in. He also liked the, um, I think it's Homer Paul. I can't remember, uh, Robin Hood and then, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and Robin Hood. Um, the, the author's last name is Pyle and he pretty much liked any of those as well. So I learned to rotate the books as we read them so that they were all, eventually we would all be getting something that was something they really truly enjoyed. So first step is building a character. The second one is inspiring a love of learning. Oh, and Becky says this, thank you for putting together a package that will give my, me practical tips as I struggle to raise my children to go against the tide, serve the Lord and their families, not simply follow the crowd. And I will tell you, character building is not normal for most people in America, unfortunately. Giving them a love of learning and using real books and not textbooks goes against the tide of many people. Homeschoolers are going against that as well, so. All right, step number three is teaching our kids how to think. First, we need to talk about what is a personal growth plan because I believe a personal growth plan will give them the ability to think. First, here's our four parts of our personal growth plan. We need to set aside the time for learning. For us, that was in the mornings. We set aside mornings for learning and we also set aside time for reading. They may have read in high school, they would read at whatever time was good for them. Let me back up, personal growth plan. This is really more for junior high and high school. There are some parts of it you can use with elementary, but it is really more for uh, junior high and high school because kids think literally in elementary school. They don't start thinking abstractly and have the ability to critically think till about ages 12 and 13. I just wanna make sure you understand where I'm coming from on this. So this is truly older kids. It, I will say this too before we move any further. If you have older kids that do not have a foundation of godly character, you need to go back there and then come back here. St always start at the beginning. And that is a foundation of character. Then we move into love of learning. And now we're moving into our personal growth plan. Set aside a time for learning each day. File quickly what you learn. This means that you could write down what you learn or um, draw a picture of what you learn. Apply quickly what you learn. This would be like share or teach what you learn. And I call this the read, write, and discuss method. This is what we did. And this is what we did in high school. We, our kids would read and they would Every day they would read the book and then they'd write one page about the book. And then once a week we would discuss the book. So every day they read, every day they wrote one page and once a week we discussed it. And if 
in that discussion, I could see what they were thinking and whether they were just thinking literally or if they began to think critically. And those discussions really began to form those opinions and ability to think about things, cause and effect. Now, we'll tell you right now that most of the time when you start this, they're just going to narrate when they write. They're just going to tell you back what it is. So you may need to give them a little um, journal starter. Like, let's say um, we were talking about Tom Sawyer and whitewashing the fence. And you might say, do you think Tom Sawyer should have, um, I don't know, collected the money? I don't really remember. What is your opinion of Tom Sawyer and what he did with the white? fence and then let them write it down. What caused Tom Sawyer to um, sit back and let all his friends paint the fence or whitewash it? So you may need to give them something and it should be a how or a why question as well. And then we want to discuss whatever it is that you're doing. And how do we do this? When we discuss, we ask a question and then we zip our lips. And yes, it's really hard because it's quiet. And you want to give the answer. And if you give the answer, what are your kids going to do? They're going to think, I don't have to think because mom will give me the answer. So if I keep quiet long enough, mom will tell me the answer and I'll just write that down. And we don't want that. We want our kids to be thinking. So here's what you do. You ask a question and you count to 100 in your head and it'll be a long time. And then if they can't answer it, you ask another question to sort of dig further down. And you ask another question you do not answer. You never answer your own question. That is how you're going to lead a discussion. Now, we had discussions all the time. They weren't necessarily homeschool or academic. But I'm sitting at our dining room table, and we still to this day have discussions around the dinner table. And it can be about any topic. So you don't have to have discussions about the book you're reading. You can have discussions every day about a topic your kids are interested in. Just throw out a question and let it go. So that is another way that you can train your kids to think. And I really believe as they learn to think, they will begin to be able to make decisions because the first year, let's say when they're, I don't know, 14 years old, you may just discuss the how and the why. Then you're going to move into opinions. And when you move into opinions, then you're going to start making, helping them make decisions. And by the time they're in, a, I don't know, 17, 18 years old, you might say, well, how, what would you have decided in this situation? What would you have done in this situation and why? That, so it begins with critical thinking and it moves into good decision making as well. All right, then the last thing is we need to remember this is academic, but it's the same thing when it comes to our relationship with God. How does it work? Just like you do a Bible study. You read your Bible, you write about it, and then you go meet with your friends and you discuss it. It is the same thing. And you can do the same thing with your kids. You can do Bible studies. You can have them read their Bible and talk about what that verse means and then discuss it and then make sure that help them apply it as well. So, so we'll make sure that we keep that spiritual thing as well. All right, so step one is character building. Step two is love of learning. Step three is teaching our kids how to think with a personal growth plan so they can make wise decisions. Step four, where in the world do we start? We start with you your education. You need to come up with your own personal growth plan. And right now it is March. I would really encourage you to take from March until, Jan until May and just do this yourself. Don't start pounding a personal growth plan on your kids until you have one of your own. And so you need to set aside a time for learning. For me, it was in the morning before anyone woke up. I would get up an hour or two before everyone. I would go for a walk. I would pray, I would come back, I would read my Bible, I would read the book that we are reading, each of the kids is reading on their own, and I could keep my reading journal. And so that was how I did it. Before I started doing this with my kids, I chose a book, and I read it for a week or two, however long it took, and every day I wrote about that book. And then I shared it, maybe with Steve, maybe with the kids. I don't remember who I shared it with, but you need to share it with someone. And then you need to pick another book and do the same thing. And then you need to pick a third book. Now, out of those three books, one of them 
needs to be on an adult level. The other two might be on a kid's level to get started. One of them needs to be something that stretches you so that you understand what your kids are going through because you're reading a book on a seventh grade reading level and that's easy. Why don't you read something on an adult level and then you'll understand why the seventh grader maybe is struggling with the seventh grade book. So it all starts with you. You need to model reading. You need to model writing, loving learning. And just what I said, choose a classic and then read, write, discuss, and then repeat. Do it at least three times before you introduce this to your children. Now, I think that's reading feeds the brain. It is evident that most minds are starving to death. I just love that quote. Um, but that's Benjamin Franklin, like what, over 300 years ago or something? And they were reading really hard books back then, but he thought people were starving to death because they didn't read very much. He would be appalled at what's going on now with all the snippets. But anyway, reading is what really is going to help your kids most of all. Now, I can't remember what the next slide says. Oh, Cherry says, thank you for taking the time to put together valuable training material on leadership education. I've been homeschooling six years. And as far as I can see, there is little to nothing available in this area of education that has any practical application for homeschooling parents and the use of mentoring. I felt like a lone horse on a deserted trail. I love her words. Everyone else that I know that homeschools is on the conveyor belt to keep up with the public education counterpart. Thank you for being a voice in the desert that will gui give guidance to as many lone horses that are headed your way. Well, thank you, Cherry. I want to close with two things. And one is that we need to follow a proven leader. And one of those is Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt was a weakling when he was born. He had asthma and he was willing to do whatever it was. Uh, but in high school, he decided he was going to do something different. And he started working out and he built himself. And you look at pictures of Teddy Roosevelt and you think he had, was a weakling when he was a kid. He was. He was willing to do whatever was necessary to accomplish his goal of overcoming asthma. Nothing was an obstacle, including these two situations. He is walking through the woods with the French ambassador and they came to a stream that had really risen and they couldn't just walk across it. He stripped down his clothes to the overflowing stream and walked across it and expected the French ambassador to follow after him. He was also campaigning for his second presidential election and he got a bullet in his chest. He refused to go to the hospital. He gave a speech one, after, one hour after he was shot with a broken rib and a bullet in his chest. He was not an overnight success by any means, but he believed that he needed to always do the right thing. And he was gonna live by the character that he was um, taught and he believed that, yeah, or I believe if you don't take action, your kids are the ones that are going to serve, that are suffer. He, Teddy Roosevelt believed in taking action no matter what. And I would just really encourage you, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, I can't believe this. He would read one book a day and he loved learning. He could talk about any subject whatsoever. So I was pretty sure that was the next slide. What is the biggest mistake moms make? This is where we're going to close. I believe the biggest mistake moms make is this. They look at education. They're like, I'm not so sure about anything, but I'm going to tell you the public education is super successful. And you're like, you are crazy, Carrie. It is super successful. Why do I say that? Because their goal is productivity, checklists, making sure, uh, comparing us to everyone else. That is public education. They're very successful, but that should not be your goal. Your goal, if you are here, is to give your kids a real education, to grow them in God, to give them a solid foundation of character, and then eventually so they can think for themselves and make decisions. How can we overcome this productivity, this checklist of, of always needing to follow out? I'm looking out the door, and there is an armadillo sitting outside my window. I can't believe. Okie dokie. Okay, we need the three R's to be able to get started. The first thing you need to do to hop off that conveyor belt and not worry about whether you're gonna mess your kids up. Remember, those were some of the things you said were happening. And to become more consistent is you need to relax. You need to take a deep breath and relax and realize that your relationship with your kids is the most important thing that you can do right now. 
relax, and then we need to rest in the Lord. God's going to show you what to do. Turn to him and ask him, what do you, God, what do you want me to do? How do I raise my kids to be Christian leaders? What parts of this thing that Carrie shared would be helpful to me? If any of it, you know, where, where do I need help? Where, what is the stuff? And rest in God. He's going to show you. He's also going to show you that all that comparison and all of that social media and everything, and I'm not talking the information, but like scroll, scroll, scroll. What's everyone else doing? That comparison is doing you no good. You need to relax and you need to rest in the Lord. And then we need to rejoice and look at the good things that God is doing for you. Look at the good things that your kids are doing. And I would encourage you to start a gratitude journal, a family gratitude journal. And every night around the table, come up with at least one thing as a family or one thing for each child and write down things that you can rejoice about and write them down. Because if you write them down, they will become a part of who you are. So relax, rest and rejoice. The Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all the details. And I think that's what happens to us as homeschool moms, as moms in general. We get so worried. Are we going to mess him up? How are we going to do this? Oh, no. Look at what they're doing and everything. We need to quit being worried. We need to just rest and we need to sit at the feet of Jesus. And he's going to show us what to do. He's going to show you what to do. So the four steps in raising Christian leaders are a firm foundation of godly character, inspiring our kids to love learning, a personal growth plan, and then start with you, your own education. You could do that now and be prepared and move forward. Now you can use some of these ideas this year, and uh, but I just wouldn't like go gun ho and change everything you're doing. You need to start with you and see how this all works in your own life so that you have experience with it and can really share it from a heartfelt sense sense of your heart anyway we have a christian leadership education course and it is normally only available in january and september but since we just had the life school leadership summit we are going to have a flash sale normally enrollment is available we had it in january we won't have it again till september but the doors are open tonight for enrollment and you can sign up now what does it include this and you can i'm just I want to tell you this because some of you are like, I need help or I need more help. Help me what, tell me, show me what you can do. Let me just tell you, it is a 12 week course and it will cover three parts of this. Raising leaders, not followers is all about giving you a biblical perspective of Christian leadership. It's about character foundation. It's about inspiring a love of learning and transitioning to independent learning. Inspire a love of learning is all about all sorts of ways that you can inspire a love of learning and then teach your children how to think with mentoring is more about our kids. Yes, it's going to be all about how to think, read, write, and discuss and giving you specifics about that. And then towards the end, it's going to talk about mentoring and college and adult life and then becoming completely independent as well. Let's take a look and see what's inside of it. In this course, you'll see it's a 12 week course with weekly assignments there are three ebooks, or there are ebooks Raising Leaders, Not Followers, Teach Your Kid Children How to Think with Mentoring. And then the one that you didn't see earlier is this one, Hop Off the Conveyor Belt. These are real life stories from moms that implemented um, leadership education. They are tips and tricks, and they're divided into different categories of leadership education. So they are practical ways that you can implement it. Then you will get three study guides as well. And then right now we have our video workshops that go along and some ebooks, some uh, transcripts that go along with raising leaders, love of learning and how to think. Oh, and the total value is $168. Something happened to that. Anyway, that's the whole course. But we also have some bonuses, a classics book list, children, youth, and adult, help for the harried homeschooler. And those are schedules, printables, lists for raising leaders, not followers. But here's the thing I'm super excited about. I am revamping this course. And if you enroll in this flash sale, you will actually be invited to our weekly live classes. They start the 1st of April. They will go for 12 weeks. If you can't make all the live classes, you will get the recordings. So what we will be doing is replacing those new live classes. We will replace these video workshops with 12 individual classes 
so that you will have individual classes and then you'll go use the eBooks and the study guides as well. We'll be working through all of this together and you will have the opportunity to be live. You'll be able to get your questions answered on each one of those. We will discuss curriculum and resources. Another thing I'm hoping to add is a resource list. But since I don't have it, I don't want to say I've got it, but I would like to have a resource list for character building, for uh, love of learning, teach your kids how to think, how do you lead discussions, how do you come up with those questions. I've got some resource ideas I want to develop with that as well. So that is the whole course. You can see it all listed there. The total value is $250.85, but our flash sale through Monday is $47. But guess what? I have something special since you're on the live one. We have a fast mover bonus. For the next 24 hours, it is only $37. You will need the code fast mover. I'm gonna put that in the chat. So if you want to get it, um, let's see. I should have planned a little ahead. Fast mover is the code. Um, and it will only be $37 if you go to the link. And I forgot to put the link on the slides. Okay, it's in the chat. So there's the, um, there's the code. $47 for all of that, including the live classes. That's a really good deal. But if you do it tonight or tomorrow, it's only $37. Plus you'll get all the bonuses. Holly says, I read through Curious Books in a few days and found them full of practical direction. She gives some very good ideas for mentoring your children, complete with age level appropriate expectations. She also shares some hints for implementing this style if you have several children. Some of you have many children and that's hard to juggle it all. And so I'd like to be able to give some extra help on that. This is the direction I've been heading. So your work will help me flesh out what this means in real life. Lots of good practical info and I love the links. Thank you very much, Holly. Another thing that is true that pretty much comes with every single resource is I always have a guarantee. This is our, I'll buy it back for 30 days. So in 30 days from whenever you buy it, if for any reason or no reason at all, you decide this information isn't right for you, it's just not a good fit, then all you need to do is send me an email and we will refund it. I don't expect or want to keep your money. I simply want to send off, just send me a quick email and we will refund it. Even if you decide the leadership e-courses for you can have the two bonuses, the, the, um, the list of e the, the classic book list, and then the printables as well. No harm done. We still park for inch. You can still get to try the course and then make up your mind. Really, this is like getting to a test drive to make sure that it will work for you. So this is what it is. I'm going to be taking some questions. If you have some questions in the chat, I will be checking those in just a minute and about anything, about any of the topics, about any of this course, feel free to do that. I have a few questions that were sent to me earlier, but this is a 12 week course. You will get weekly assignments um, just to remind you and you will, those assignments will say, read this ebook, these pages, watch this video, do these study questions or read this part of a transcript or look at hop off the conveyor belt and the practical ideas every week. In fact, there is a girl named, Ju I don't even know if Judy's on here and I don't know if she might. Okay. There was a girl, I won't use her name um, today in our community group that said, I just finished Carrie's Christian leadership education course. And I've got a few questions. And so she had worked through it independently. She signed up in January and she's finished with the 12 week course. And so she will still be invited because I told the people in January, you'll be invited to our private, our online private um, live classes each week as well. And so the 12 week course is $47 and those are our weekly assignments, ebooks. There are three different prices there. We have three study guides, video workshops, and then our bonus resources. That includes our live workshops. Now, the live workshops will take place in a private group. I have an old private group that I am closing this week, and I'm opening a new one because I was not able to attend to it and do justice to those people that joined it. So what I want to do is start one with just our Christian leadership people. And so we'll truly be exclusive, and we will really talk and dive into these ideas that I've been talking about. So it is $47 through Monday midnight, but right now... If you use the word fast mover, you can get it for $37 as well. 
So if we have any questions, leave them. Is there a link to order? Yes, there is. And I forgot. Okay, I'm going to just guess. Oh, actually, the page you came from has the link. And um, I really want to say it's four steps. So it's howtohomeschoolmychild.com slash four steps. Oh, you know what? I can guarantee I can actually do this on my phone. I'm really not much of a very good multitasker, but um, let me just see if that's it. That's a really good question. And normally... I have the link written on the PowerPoint, but I was redoing a lot of things and I guess I deleted it. Let's see if four steps works. Four steps. I hope so. Nope, it doesn't work. Oh yeah, it does. If you go to howtohomeschoolmychild.com slash four steps, you will land on the page that you came to for watch and it will say Christian Leadership Education Course. And you just click on that and it will take you right there. Okay, so how to homeschoolmychild.com slash four steps and you will be able to get there. Now, let me just get back to YouTube without losing it. All right, thank you, Jan, for that question. That was a very good question. Um, are there any other questions? Feel free, yeah. Sarah, yes, there was an armadillo. I really haven't seen armadillos in like 20 years. And that's the second time this year. I was at my daughter's house um, in January and they were talking about an armadillo because their dog kept waking up in the middle of the night and I came back and the next day I was leaving for a walk and I heard rustling and I turned around and there was this little armadillo just scurrying across that morning and I took a picture and anyway yes we have armadillos in Texas okay let me just I'm going to sort of check and see if there are any questions um, and if not I will ask a few of the I will answer some of the questions that I got uh, earlier um, I like some of y'all's comments about your kids and what they enjoyed um, learning as well. Oh, and Christina, I am a teacher by profession and love learning and teaching. My 14 year old son only likes to learn things that he likes. I was a teacher by profession too. I taught six years in the public school and then I've done all sorts of education after that. And so I love learning and I always have loved it as well. So Love reading aloud daily, trying to start this. My older children came into the room when I read to the younger ones. They never got tired of hearing me. And that's really good. I think the thing we've lost, and I see this even in churches, is we still try to age segregate everything. And let's face it, that only started with Woodrow Wilson when he started his thing about the worker bees. Before the 1900s, everyone learned together. Everyone read together. We, and you raise I mean, you just got to interact on such a different level of thinking as well. Howard Powell, you're right. Uh, Crystal, thank you for sharing that. It is a family favorite. We love those. Tom Sawyer traded the opportunity. That's what I was thinking, to whitewash the fence for boys' treasures like marbles. I couldn't remember if it was money or something else. So, all right. Do you have some sort of printable schedule for school? I actually do have a printable schedule for school, Amy, and it's in a blog post and I would have to go look for it. Since I don't have it handy right here, what I will do is, I don't know if you're in our Facebook group, I will post it tomorrow in our Facebook group and you can go look at it. There are, I think, two blog posts and there it actually tells about how I started my day with our family time and reading aloud and what we did throughout the day. And it also has a younger elementary schedule and an older uh, um, kids schedule as well. That's a really good question. Again, when does the class start? Heather, very good. I believe uh, the week after Easter is when we will be starting that class. And I don't have the exact day of the week, but what will happen is we will have a day of the week and we will meet on that day at the same time every, every week. And I know that may or may not work with everyone's schedule, but hopefully towards, and it's going to be 12 weeks. So that's long. I'm like, oh my gosh, can't believe I'm committing. So that's like the end of June. So you've got a lot of time to be able to pop in and out. The other thing is if you're not able to hit the live class, let's just say it's Tuesday afternoon. You can still interact because you could go watch it Tuesday night if you have a conflict Tuesday afternoon. And then we will be talking about that one class all week long in this new private group. And then we will come back to it the next week. Now, I will tell you, I'm doing this so that I can then pull all of this together 
And then hopefully in September, when we um, open enrollment again, I will be selling the new videos and it's not going to be 47. It normally, it would be 67. That's my normal price. I'm going to be probably changing the price to 97. And that 47 is probably going up to 57 or 67 in September. I haven't quite decided what that's going to be, but I know that, um, uh, the price is definitely going to be going up in September because of the way we're going to restructure all of this and because we're going to have the private class and the interaction and we'll have Q&A and I think people will really be able to benefit from all of that. So that's a really good question. Let me check again. I, I am in the group. That will be super helpful. Good, Amy. I'm glad. What is the Facebook group name here? Heather, very good question. Facebook.com slash groups slash how to homeschool my child, how to, it's written right there. Now that's not it, but if you just copy that, how to homeschool on the screen, how to homeschool my child.com. If you search for that, or if you go to facebook.com slash groups slash how to homeschool my child, that will get you to the community group. And I will tell you, we started this group less than a year ago. It was last April and it has just grown. We have three, over 3000 people, I don't know how many exactly. The thing I like about it is people are kind and people are, feel that you feel safe to ask a question. Just like Judy had just finished this Christian leadership education course and she had a question. So she just went to the community group and asked it. There was someone else last week with a special needs child that put a question in there. There was someone else looking today for Latin curriculum. So it's a great place to be able to ask questions. Plus, we're constantly giving out good information and sharing and just trying to build relationships so that you feel comfortable. Hopefully, every day we're sharing at least one or two blog posts or pieces of information that will help you as well. So anyway, thanks for asking that. All right, let's see what other questions. You're welcome, Heather. I'm just so excited that I'm able to do this and read the phone and do all that. And it's actually working. Let me just review for a minute and then we're going to close. Um, the four steps really are simple. They're going to take time and it, it still takes energy and you are in the midst of it. But I will guarantee you it's going to flash by in the blink of an eye. But give your kids first a firm foundation of character. That is always the first place to start. I don't care if they are 17 or seven or two, that's where they need to start. And then we want them to love learning so that they have the tools of learning. And I didn't say this, but in here, we will be talking, when we talk about love of learning, that whole section, we will be talking about tools of learning because your kids need the tools of learning. If they're gonna love learning, they have to know how to learn. So we'll talk about tools of learning, um, but that's number two is inspiring our kids to love learning. And then three, step three is teaching our kids how to think, read, write, and discuss is a great strategy. There are many, but that's the one that I like to use. And then where do we all start? Step four is you. Unfortunately, we can't just give them a book. It takes a relationship with your kids to raise leaders. And so I'm not gonna ever say, oh, here, just pass off this video and your kid will be a leader. There are some videos saying watch, but that's not really how we do it. So, and then this course is $47 through um, Monday. If you would like to get it tonight or tomorrow, first 24 hours, fast mover bonus, fast mover code is fast mover. You can go to how to homeschool my child slash four steps, and it will have a link right there for you to be able to click Christian leadership education course, and you're able to buy that as well. I really appreciate your time. Y'all have encouraged me today. And um, if you have any other questions, either email me or pop them in the community group and we will just continue this conversation. Y'all have a great evening.